on tonight? A little bit more enthusiasm. Come on. All right. Two, two days. Okay. Good. Some people here Thursday. Um, just a few things before we get going. Uh, photos are fine, but no flash photography, please. Uh, if you've got a cell phone, please set it on silent. Uh, and it uh, doesn't look like it's going to be a problem right now, but just no standing up or sitting against the walls or any of the aisleways. The fire marshals are kind of cranking this year. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Call Classics. Take it away. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. So, we're here to talk about the hanging creature features. To my left here, I have Negative Steve. He is a culture writer for GeekNewsNetwork.com and is written for Jackalow Branch. Oh, I'm sorry, my name is Ruby, I'm a moderator. I'm just here to help everything to move slowly and smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> you can see him perform stand-up tomorrow night at 7.30 at Phoenix, 7.30 in the Phoenix Comedy Dot Org Free Comedy Show and Sunday at 2 p.m. for This Day in History. From Earth Unknown, Waste Unknown, Trivia Champion, and a horror franchise tag team cast with Captain Negative Steve. Staff member of Cult Classics AZ, publisher of Fake Blood Fanzine, and a vocalist for horror-focused death metal band Splatterkill. And then we have Adam Rutowski. He was a film student at Minneapolis College of Art and Design, MCAD, a Foley sound designer, a sound recording engineer, and producer of over 200 bands, a former employee of Apple Inc., and now a proud pizza maker. And then, Victor Moreno is the programmer for Pulp Classics AZ, a local revival film series celebrating their third anniversary, showing offbeat, classic, and genre films. He's also an artist and illustrator, designed websites for bands such as Led Zeppelin, Bon Jovi, The Killers, Michael Jackson, etc. He's designed horror soundtracks for One Way Static Records as well. So, yay, everybody! <laughs> All right, time to get this show on the road. So who's excited to find out about the king of the creature features? Woo! All right, so first off, let's just define our terms. Uh, we're gonna talk about franchises today. A franchise, for our understanding, is told to us by the ever-knowing Wikipedia is franchise, a noun, a collection of related films in succession. See also sequels, trilogies, sagas, and cinematic universes. That's our latest lovely term for a franchise. But next, we're going to talk about what makes a successful franchise. If we're talking about just in terms of monetary franchise and genre films, these are the only four film franchises in the top 32 highest grossing franchises of all time that are even remotely horror sci-fi. And that's the Brendan Fraser mummy, not the Boris Karloff mummy, although I really think looking at that picture that the real monster in that film is his hair piece. But uh, in all honesty, you can look at uh, number 16 is on that list purely by combining every Aliens and Predator movie and the combined ones. So you're talking about Alien, Aliens, Alien Resurrection, Alien 3, Predator, Predator 2, Alien vs. Predator, Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Terminator is number 23 on there by adding even the reboot, Terminator Salvation. We don't even want to know what the next one, Terminator Genesis. But I would say, you know, speaking as an individual, the Jaws deserves that position, although it's really only up there for the gross of the first film, Jaws, not Jaws 3D or Jaws 4 The Revenge. <laughs> but really, let's look at what we think franchise makes a franchise successful next. We're going to look at a history. Now, in terms of an overview, the first real big franchise that, I, that we want to talk about in, in terms of an overview is the Universal Studios Monsters franchise, which started in the 30s. Now, if you look at films that around this time with, uh, you know, James Whale Frankenstein or Todd Browning's Dracula, um, these films really captured the imagination, and Universal had stars like Lon Chaney on their roster. And, like, we're really going to take advantage of this and crank out quality sequels. Frankenstein had 
Son of Frankenstein, The Bride of Frankenstein. These movies were really successful, and it went from the 1930s even down to the late 50s, I think even early 60s if you count some of the latter ones like uh, This Island Earth. But if that was the case for even the latter installments, like uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, they're still kind of entertaining, you know? So quality and staying true to the spirit of the monster is kind of important next. But other studios took up that same thing. A notable example here is Hammer, which in the same period was the British studio that had a house style um, and had popular British actors, which we consider now the fathers of modern horror, along the lines of um, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. And, you know, these are people that you can't really imagine horror movies without. And it had a kind of like this combined universe where even though some of the films got kind of wacky, like Dracula 80, 1972, or even something like um, the uh, Shaw Brothers Hammer Code production later on in the late 70s, um, Seven Golden Vampires, which had Dracula possessing a Shaolin monk and going to China to fight uh, Peter Cushing as Van Helsing's uh, future descendant, were still kind of crazy but really fun. If you get a chance to find that movie, which is on YouTube, you should totally find it. Um, because it's another case where a house style and staying true to the spirit of the series is kind of cool. I will say, Dracula 80, 1972, really weird. Howard Hughes as Dracula in spirit. But at the same time, not the next slide, but staying this time period, there's other countries and other studios and stuff like Hammer, like Toho Studios, check Godzilla and built a whole universe around it. You know, so other studios realized Universal had a point going on that we should take and kind of develop a universe around our characters next. And uh, one of those, uh, one of the ways to look at it is independent filmmakers had a streak of their own. So when John Carpenter went and talked to Mustafa Khad and sold his movie Halloween about a mysterious killer known as The Shape, it became the most high successfully grossing independent film of its time. And from then you realize, wow, even independent films can kind of build universes. Um, originally, John Carpenter's idea for this uh, Halloween was every film in and of itself was going to be an anthology. Something you see today with stuff like American Horror Story or even like True Detective. Um, okay, so. In terms of franchise building, next, we look at toward the 80s. Other people took other studios like Paramount and New Line Cinema, which built its house on Freddy Krueger, realized slasher characters could go ahead and build a whole universe around them that could get the audience invested in themselves. There are third, there are over a, about a, a dozen, probably 13 film, probably 13 films. How many Nightmare on Elm Street movies will they do now that they've done a remake? You know, but there's a quality in it. Next, in fact, in the '90s, uh, Miramax and Dimension went after a lot of independent properties. Even though Hellraiser came out in the '80s, it was the property was bought up and the whole Hellraiser universe was built. Wes Craven ended up becoming one of these people who produced films and put his name on them in terms of Wes Craven presents Wishmaster, which is a KMB effects created movie that people do the special effects for most of these movies. Um, Dimension started finding independent properties like The Crow, and even though Brandon Lee died, unfortunately, they still built a massive franchise around him, which got worse and worse after every installment. And let's not talk about Scream, the modern, uh, what brought us to the modern meta horror franchise. We need to examine why this is scary in an ironic way. So next. <laughs> We get to what makes a good horror franchise. We kind of talked a little bit in an overview about, well, it could be a studio playing and it could be the filmmaker, it could just be the property. Well, speaking for us as a group, and this is to be a subjective exercise, we came up with a few ideas that we thought would do it. Our criteria for a good franchise is, a good franchise expands the series mythology. Every good original horror film sets down certain rules. I hate to sound like that asterisk screen, but there you go. Um, but it's important. Um, a good installment in a series, a franchise, will move the story forward. You know, I, this is me being a 
putting on a peak, but I don't really want to know how monsters were born. I want to know the mythology and kind of expand it out there. And every uh, good franchise installment should be true to the original film. You shouldn't go about five or six in and say your serial killer was really a part of a secret project to discover evil. I'm just saying. Um, and a good franchise should make you excited for the next film. You really want to know what's going to happen in the next Nightmare on Elm Street movie. You know, you really want to know what's going to happen in the next, you know, trick or treat. You know, maybe we'll know. It has to lay the seeds there. And we're going to go, we each have picked a champion in this race. And you're going to get a chance to weigh in. And we're going to say what we think makes a good franchise individually. Okay, negative Steve, what's yours? Um, my franchise is uh, the Godzilla franchise. When I was uh, a young boy, when most young boys were discovering dinosaurs, I discovered the creature features on my local independent television station. And there was a movie called Destroy All Monsters, which was pretty much every monster in the, uh, that, that Toho had at that time battling it out uh, rumble style. And I just fell in love. Um, Godzilla, to me, he's, he is not so much a monster as a force of nature. You, you pretty much do not defeat Godzilla. You just kind of try to stay out of Godzilla's way and, and minimize the damage. And then, uh, you know, the original is a truly frightening movie. Uh, if you watch it, it's just you know, terrifying to watch this creature just come out and start stomping on the city. And then as the, the franchise continues, the tones will shift back and forth. And some of them are scary, and some of them are exciting, and some of them are silly, and some of them are just got awful. But uh, you gotta love them all. Thank you. Kirby? So I have difficulty picking uh, just one because close to my heart is my black heart is two film franchises, which is The Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, both that were made sequentially, uh, 1973 and 1974. Um, they both were not intended to be franchises, um, and they just work so well. So for The Exorcist is my favorite film of all time. It is the most terrifying film ever made, and not because it wins in every polls, but because of the resonance it has in not only the horror community, but the world at large. Um, both the novel, and I think because William Peter Blatty, the author of the novel, was directly involved in the film, uh, William Friedkin, the director, he was the, uh, had just come off the French Connection, was his first big film, and the energy and the power in that, he transferred the Exorcist, he had some very unorthodox methods for coaxing out his actors, and just made it amazing, so it's just, there's just so many levels, such a perfect cast, such a perfect film, because to me, the best horror films are almost always drama related. They're there. It's at the heart of it. That's what's most frightening is the fear of the unknown. So um, I also would like City Exodus 3. It's the, probably the most terrifying. It's about even on those two. Um, the other sequels is actually the same prequel story told by three different directors at three different time periods. Can't really back that, up, but still interesting. Texas Chainsaw, perfect movie as well. Absolutely, anybody's seen it. It has a documentary feel. It's just terrifying. Um, it was made for very little, completely unknown actors, um, and you know, spawned a legend as well, and definitely in the character of Leatherface and the Sawyer family, and later the Hewitt family in the sequels, and I think it's one of the only commonly made remakes. Um, it's, it's just definitely that heart of what another fear of the unknown is definitely looked like rural America and based on the serial killer, um, you know, Ed Gein and how it inspired it, even though he was actually a serial killer, still very interesting. So I definitely feel the two, though radically different, uh, have a lot of parallels. So that's why my choice. Thank you. Adam? Hellraiser. <laughs> when I was a small child, <coughs> I, I saw a lot of horror films on purpose. My, when I, when I, actually, when I turned 18, I asked my mom, and you start asking your parents certain questions about their life, how they met, certain things in your life that you felt maybe that you missed or had missed opportunities. I, I asked my mom, why did I not go see Peter Pan? Why didn't I go see Snow White? Why didn't you take me to go see Pinocchio? Her answer, which I'll never forget for the rest of my life, is, is because you wanted to see the Hellraisers. You wanted to see all the slasher films. You wanted to go all these scary movies. And I had to take you to all of them. So I was like, okay, well, that's, you know, that's cool. So Hellraiser was one that was one of the first ones that I saw in the theater 
with my mom. I don't remember being with my mother. I just, I remember the screen just completely enveloping everything, the mysteriousness behind the, all the characters. I want to know everything about each and every single one of them. I was already a huge Clyde Barker fan. I already met him before the film came out. And so that has a lot to do with, with the mythos behind it and the characters. Um, even though I didn't really understand everything and everything that Clyde Barker was writing or what was happening on the screen, that was part of the, the compulsion to know more and wanting to see the, the sequels afterwards. Now, we know that it's maybe not the perfect series. Um, you know, it, it has its little bumps in the road, and this might be going against what we're all you know, competing for and, and, and fighting against. But there is something to be said later on with Rick Foda being such a mega fan, and I was always so jealous as a potential filmmaker at the time that he was taking over the reins, he was writing, directing and he wanted to bring back the series in a truer form and even though I think it lost a little bit of the focus I, I don't think Pinhead is should be the focus of the entire Hellraiser series so this is why I applauded Rick Boda for taking a chance and making it more psychological and dealing with the character struggles the and the types of things that characters had to go through psychologically and the type of thing that they're struggling with, which goes back to even what the original stories were about in print, um, that Clyde Barker was going through as well, with his struggle with S&M and being gay and uh, just putting that in writing. So, and I thought that that was a good way that they put together the series and um, made it thrive throughout the years. Thank you, Victor. So I'm going to try to keep it short so we can get to the actual meat of the discussion here. Um, my pick for what I think the best horror franchise is, is Nightmare on Elm Street. And for a lot of reasons, not, not the least of which is if you think of a horror movie monster in the last 30 years, who do you think of instantly but Freddy Krueger? You can make an argument for Michael Myers, you can make an argument for Jason, but just in terms of how we're defining the scope of the argument, I would say the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise has been the most true in terms of developing very simple rules for its franchise, having an antagonist that is uh, defined by a, a good backstory, uh, strong, anti strong protagonist, and it keeps you wanting to go in there and see how he's going to kill people and how he's going to be defeated. You don't go into a Nightmare on Elm Street movie thinking Freddy is going to be killed. There's just no way that's going to happen. And you can do it because he's not a real person. He's either a dream demon or some kind of fictional creation versus something like Jason, which could be a ghost in the first movie or some kind of lumbering, idiotic zombie who can somehow travel to New York and then gets blown up and becomes a worm you can eat. You know, or Michael Myers, which is some guy who uh, is either a project created by evil cultists, or you know, is some dude who just beat up a uh, Ken Borey in a bathroom. So, my pick, Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now our panelists are going to talk about just each topic individually. Um, just one minute, gentlemen. How does your series you chose expand the mythology? <coughs> After they brought that up, we're gonna open it up to the crowd for counter discussion and points, other series that you might wanna defend. So, negative Steve? Well, the, yeah, the Godzilla series was expanded pretty quickly. The first movie was just one monster versus the humans and the city. The second movie uh, introduced Anguirus as uh, Godzilla's recurring uh, frenemy, I think is the word. And then from there, it just kept expanding. Uh, we got Mothra, and then Mothra would keep returning. Uh, we had uh, some returning villains such as uh, King Ghidorah, and then later Mecha Ghidorah. Um, and you know the franchise just kept expanding, adding more characters and more monsters. Some of them returned. Uh, I think Godzilla and Ghidorah fought three or four times. Um, and although, you know, as we mentioned, the, the tone shifted, and some of them were more serious, and some of them were more silly, and some of them were kid-oriented. Uh, it just, you know, the mythology was there up to the point where 
you know, later on in the future, they created Monster Island and just kept all the monsters in one page place, their own little monster aquarium. <laughs> Thank you, Kirby. Uh, for the Exorcist, I mean, definitely the mythology, like I said, both the series I picked, Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw were not actually intended as franchises or anything. But with the Exorcist, it had a great uh, novel written by Pete William Pierre Blatty, uh, which uh, has a great deal that was not actually included in the film. And then um, he actually did continue on years later and wrote a book called Legion, which is what became Exorcist 3 and actually directed the film himself. Um, and then in between that uh, is part two, uh, which is also remade, is part four by two different directors, and the director of the second film actually made it numerous times, but they're just, it's the same prequel story of how Marin became the exorcist, his first exorcism that led down the path. Um, you just have a lot of characters involved, a lot of, uh, you know, in the exorcist, it's the uh, uh, wind demon Pazuzu, who actually is a real demon in uh, Babylonian Mesopotamian mythology. And it just is very rich. Uh, a lot of characters, like I said, it's very steeped in the, the drama, struggles of faith, the mystery of faith, and just absolutely powerful. Uh, it, it shocked me to the core the first time I saw both uh, the first and the third films, and still do. For Texas Chainsaw, obviously, has had a lot longer lifespan and a lot more characters based around the Sawyer family and later the Hewitt family, as I explained. And it's just that you want to know why these people, how it became that way. And uh, there was commentary in the first film basically on uh, the Vietnam War, which was still being fought, and uh, you know the Depression era of uh, rural environments. Um, and just absolutely uh, fascinating, as well as the economic downturn of that time period. And I just feel like there's just so many levels you can go on with both franchises, and that is uh, what keeps it so vibrant and interesting and has been expanded so much. Thank you. Adam? Well, I kind of went down my little bit about how, from the first one, but really through the first four, I really, it, it, was, it was centralized on the Cenobites. They obviously, from the first one, they didn't, Clyde Barker's intention wasn't to focus on Pinhead, but that's where the franchise kind of took off. That's where they identified uh, their strongest character was in Pinhead, and that's where they expanded. Like I said, the first one had so much mystery to it, it didn't explain a lot. This is just the circumstances that were presented before them. The real story was with the Cotton fam family, specifically Frank, where they went from there, kind of took a different turn. Second one explained the story a little bit more. They explained what the Leviathan was. They explained wh who the Cenobites were, how they were created. Third one kind of went into the more territory of making Pinhead more of kind of like a Freddy Krueger character, kind of capitalizing on more of the humorous aspects of doing, you know, quick little funny quips or funny ways to kill people or even more amusing Cenobites. The fourth one, we go to space. Now they have a new twist to it because, of course, you know, horror franchises eventually have to do their space epic. <laughs> even if it makes sense or not. That's okay. Uh, and it also went back into the, the history of the box and the engineer. And then, then it, it switched to where it was almost like fan base, where it took over, went back to the Cotton family again. But then went into the psychological. They were trying new things, and they were working more toward what the book was trying to do, is make it more about the, the characters and the situations and their, their own internal struggles with life and things that were going on around them. So, I think it has a nice thing to more. Um, well, I think with The Nightmare on Elm Street, if you've seen the films, it's easy enough to see how the first one is basically, the mythology is the entire crux for why Freddy is going after the, sur the surviving children of the parents who burned him to death for being a child killer. I'm sticking with child killer in this mythology. Um, uh, and you realize, you know, Freddie had done some questionable things, he was lynched by the parents, and in this sort of death state, he figured out a way to get retribution. You can see Freddie is sort of an anti-hero in this movie, a theme that would be repeated later. Um, in A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, you realize, um, how can we make this sort of bigger? Oh, Freddie wants to incarnate in the real world by possessing someone. Um, and that doesn't work out, but in A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, he goes back to, see, that didn't work, let me try to get these other children, these dream warriors, 
um, and they're surviving Elm Street children and trying to get his ultimate revenge there, but then they bring him, and Nancy, who was the protagonist of the first film, to kind of tie it all together, and what ends up happening here is you kill the, the main antagonist, which really doesn't happen, especially in the culture we have of the final girl in horror films, and you realize more of Freddie's backstory, that his mother was a nun, and he was raped, and she was raped, so he's a son of a thousand maniacs, and then what happens there is that's basically the first chapter of Freddy's story, because starting from A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, you switch to the new heroine, Alice, and basically how, uh, it was supposed to be Kristen, but um, Rosanna, uh, Patricia Arquette didn't want to come back, so Freddy sort of terrorizes her in A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, the Dream Master, she takes on the attributes of the killed Elm Street children. Um, and then, you know, she tries to possess uh, to possess Alice's baby and the dream child. I'm gonna ignore Freddy's dead, the final nightmare. Um, but basically, I'm being comical, but basically you can see how uh, in this space, Freddy's mythology is what drives his character forward. Okay, and for, for one, I'm glad that we have talking about horror movies next to <laughs> the screaming and horrors. That's, that's perfect timing. Does anybody want to bring up any questions or comments about this so far? Expand the series mythology. Anybody have any counterpoints? You know, like favorite franchises that we missed. Yeah. Okay. Good. We welcome discussion. Uh, moves the story forward. Steve. Negative Steve. Uh, the Godzilla franchise is do the Godzilla franchise doesn't really have one one story. It's just kind of the adventures of uh, our friendly hero as he bops around and hits other monsters. Uh, it's been it's been rebooted a couple of times. The first couple of times it's just hard to tell because since there isn't a, a continuous through line, the fact that they reset the history uh, doesn't really doesn't really strike you unless you're unless you're really deep in the series. Uh, the new Godzilla film is sort of a soft reboot. Um, it could be a reboot or it could not be a reboot, depending on how you interpret it. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, although I, it definitely is a franchise, there isn't a, a, a through line that is being forwarded in each individual film. It's just all, you know, who's Godzilla gonna beat up this week? <laughs> yeah. uh, for The Exorcist, it's really, like I said, the author's involvement was really important both in the first film, of course, and then in the third film, it's interesting because Reagan McNeil, the possessed girl in the film series, and Marin, or Marin and uh, Carrie.